a scripture reading from uh, the book of Ephesians and the second chapter. And I'll begin at the first verse. And you, have the quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace we are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Well, I, uh, I found out what this feels like to be called on at the last minute, so just so you all know. Um, uh, what I'm conscious of is uh, what a sinner that I am. So in case you ever find yourself in that spot or wonder what it feels like, that's it. Oh, it's a new, uh, new experience for me. I was in charge one time of a service and... Uh, there was a lot of people there, and they were expecting to hear somebody that everybody knew and was looking forward, and he didn't come, and he didn't come, and he didn't come. So we had a prayer and came out, uh, and I, I just assumed I was going to have to because there was nobody else there. And uh, just as we sang the first hymn, he walked up the aisle, and I thought, Phew. <laughs> I uh, was uh, studying yesterday evening for the uh, the reunion and uh, I had found in um, in fact I don't know where I found it I gather things and they end up on top of my desk but it was uh, it wasn't a 3 by 5 it was about a 3 by 7 or 8 uh, notebook from 1955 and my grandmother had taken notes of all the uh, preaching at the reunion that week and they were men that everyone would know you would recognize all their names <clears throat> and you know the preaching the subjects were pretty much the same as what you'd hear today um, and I was looking at the notes that she had made and they were some of the same questions and thoughts probably that any of us would have but it was 1955 it was even before I was poor um, When uh, when John made this statement, it's in the, where do I have it here? I, I never study out of this book. It's not marked. It's my wife's book. But I bring it for convenience. I'm going to have to quit carrying it because I have no, no notes, no markings, no anything. Uh, in the third chapter of John, the 31st verse, he writes this. He must increase... He must increase, but I must decrease. Um, brothers and sisters, even the, the uh, man that was that we were studying, the man who left that testimony, uh, Paul, uh, and the things that he did, uh, Paul was uh, an educated man. He had position. Um, and he went around doing what he thought was right, even when he was persecuting the saints. But what made the difference with him was God tapped him on the shoulder and he changed not only his whole life, but he changed the direction that Paul went about with good intents before. He thought he was doing right when he persecuted the saints. But even for somebody in Paul's position, Paul decreased so that Jesus Christ could increase. And brothers and sisters, that's what is stopping us from being blessed in a greater way, from the work exploding, because that's what's going to happen. When the Lord blesses His people, when it's time to move and to touch earth with heaven, the work is going to explode. 
then you and I will become very, very insignificant. What will become significant will be Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, how many times do we go through our day, in fact, another confession? I'm sitting in the back, I know the speaker's gone, and I'm thinking, I know him, I know what he's going to do. And what I was thinking is that in my daily life, I probably wouldn't have contact with any of you if it wasn't for the church. It's, it's the church, it's Jesus Christ that has brought us here even though we come from different walks. And I was, as I was thinking that and running, having that run through my head, Rick comes through the door and he sits down one chair over from me and I think, oh, that's not quite right, is it? Brothers and sisters, the people that we touch every day, the people that we see every day, need to see something in us that's not only that reflection of Jesus Christ, but what they need to see is us decrease and Jesus Christ increase. And brothers and sisters, this is His church. We know that, we say that, but we haven't lived that way. I don't know that that is uh, something that's any different today as it was in 1955 or 1832. I think it's the same. But one of the things that I find encouraging, very encouraging, is that as I um, read the scriptures and look at what's to come, even these, this scripture reading, the call to worship in the, uh, section one, <clears throat> I believe wholeheartedly that these things are coming to pass. That whether we're a part of it or not, it's going to happen. But what gives me encouragement and hope, excitement, is that we have a chance to be a part of it, you see? Because you can look through the scriptures from Genesis on, and all these prophets of past times, some, not all of them, but a lot of them were able to look into our day. They could see through time and they could see what was going to happen. And yet, brothers and sisters, they are not here today. What they left us was a witness. What they left us was something to stand on. They left us a foundation. But brothers and sisters, that foundation is for us to move forward. And what encourages me, what gives me hope, what gives me strength, it's the knowledge that, that I am here and, and you are here. You're, you're here in this day and time for a purpose and for a reason. God chose you, and this is my own opinion, but I think God uh, asked us before we were allowed to be here in this day and time, will you go and do this for me? I believe that. I can't prove that to you, but that's what I believe. And I believe that that same bargain was probably made with every one of us. And so that privilege of being here in the last days, brothers and sisters, it's, it's ours. And as you read through the things that have happened in the past for those who have went on before, and you can just be amazed by them. The things that the Lord did in their lives, the experiences they had, but yet they're not here. You and I are. So, so what, what has to happen from here on out? What, what are the steps that we make? And the steps are these, brothers and sisters. We need to decrease so that Jesus Christ can increase. We need to put aside those, uh, those, uh, those parts of our life. You know, I guess it's like this. When you're baptized, you commit yourself, you commit your physical well-being to the arms of that one who's going to put you under the water and you know you're going under and some people are terrified of that but they have a hope, they have a belief that they're going to be lifted up brothers and sisters that's the way our life is our relationship with Jesus Christ has to be we have to be able to lay ourselves back in his arms any time any day any situation with the hope and the belief that he's going to lift us back up and brothers and sisters, there isn't a one person here who can lift his own self up. And anybody that thinks otherwise is probably going to church somewhere else today. It's not a good feeling to, uh, 
to feel sinful, to, uh, to, to be a sinner. It, it's just not a good feeling, and a lot of people will never want to, uh, they don't want to hear that. I've heard comment before, I don't want to go to church and be told I'm a sinner, I already know that, I want to hear something else. Well, brothers and sisters, the day that we come into church and there's no sinners among us that we've all been forgiven, I think we'll hear something different. The, uh, the questions that run through people's minds and hearts, uh, whether they've been in the church a long time or out of the church, is, is this work real? Is it truthful? Or is it just a, a good way to live? Um, is it something that somebody made up? Um, I feel very, very blessed because in my life, that question's been answered for me. I, I know that this work was true. And it's kind of a burden in a way because I don't have any excuses. You see, that's all that does for you. If, if you're one that's searching, you know, wondering with those same questions, is this true, am I doing the right thing? <clears throat> when your answer comes, you're going to realize that you don't have any excuse anymore. You see, people think, oh, if I only knew I could do this, that, and the other thing. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> if that's what's stopping you, if that's what's stopping you to commit yourselves to the arms of Jesus Christ, then when that time happens, when that comes, you're going to be very disappointed because then you don't have an excuse anymore because you are already known. You can't say, oh, Father, I didn't know. I didn't know this because, well, that's not the case anymore. My grandmother was... Uh, whose notes I was reading, uh, came from, uh, I guess, well, there's some advantages of being born into a, a family of church members. Uh, and one of the advantages is like what happened last night. I found my grandmother's notes. If I was a convert to the church, that would have ever happened. So I've had a lot of blessings in that way because they have given me testimonies and uh, direction over time from the time I was a little kid. <clears throat> my grandmother was given uh, several promises. Uh, one that stands out in writing was her uh, patriarchal blessing where she was told that she would be given the gifts of dreams in the night. And following that promise was uh, instructions that she raised her children as if she was tending a flower garden. Well, <clears throat> my grandmother knew what tending a flower garden meant because her grandmother had uh, told her a testimony where she had she had died was died in the presence of a physician, uh, pronounced dead, and uh, was administered to and had come back. And the first thing she said she'd seen <clears throat> was that she found herself before a garden uh, that was so beautiful and indescribably beautiful <clears throat> that the best she could do was tell what she had witnessed, and that was the flowers that were emitting hymns of praise to the Lord. <clears throat> Every kid in our family, including my own children, have heard this testimony numerous times. We, we know what tending a garden means. It's not just going out and pulling the weeds, but it's making it something so perfect that the beauty therein cannot be contained. My grandmother knew this, and yet the condition she had for that blessing was that she had found a man who decided he did not want her children, and she put them in foster homes. When I was a when I was 14, you remember being 14? <clears throat> you know everything. <clears throat> when I was 14, I was taller than my dad and that weighed him. Um, I thought I was about the smartest thing that I ever walked. Um, I wasn't old.
my uh, well, my grandmother um, let me read her blessing. I said, Grandma, do you have a gift of dreams? And she said, well, she said I had one dream that I can remember that I knew came from the Lord. She said it came right after I had that blessing, and I've never had another one. Well, she had given her children up within a month of having that blessing. So the gift was taken away. <clears throat> As I got older, um, I went away to uh, went away to school, went away from home, and uh, man, I was having a good time. You can't believe how much fun it is to be 600 miles away from your parents and pretty much have your meals provided for and uh, no supervision whatsoever. I had a lot of fun. At least I thought it was a lot of fun. And uh, after a while, I was just getting these uh, foreboding feelings like I shouldn't be doing this. I should be doing something else. And I, and I had several dreams. <clears throat> And it was beyond my experience, and I thought the reason these are coming was because there was too many foreign substances in my brain that didn't belong there. And I was worried. I thought that's what it was. And um, I went home. I got really sick. Uh, drove home. Uh, my mother took me to the hospital. They pumped me full of, of uh, penicillin, antibiotics, and codeine. I ended up having pneumonia. <clears throat> And so I was home for a week from school, convalescing. And I confided in my mother about these dreams. <clears throat> these things that were happening. I didn't even refer to them as dreams. I told her about these experiences. And she didn't say anything. But she went and uh, got her patriarchal blessing, which was given a different time, different time period, generation later, different part of the country. And there was no connection whatsoever to what her mother was told. And in her blessing, it said that the gifts of promise to others shall be manifest through you. And it began to talk in her blessing about gifts that her children, children would be provided. And I knew exactly when she showed me that where those dreams had come from. Because a, a gift that is unused it's, it's just as if it wasn't given. The, the scriptures bear that out. <clears throat> the whole point of this being, brothers and sisters, that the gift that we have, that each one of us have in common, the gift that binds us and draws us together, is that knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that he's coming here again upon this earth to reign, to be here with us. Now, you can choose to accept that gift, or you can reject it. And just like that gift of dreams that was given to my grandmother, if you choose not to accept it, it's as if it wasn't given to you, but it will be given to someone else. Now that opportunity to be here, to have a part in Zion, to witness the culmination of the ages, is ours. It's, it's our choice. Even if you die before that happens, don't you know that there's a host, a heavenly host coming with him? And it will be so bright and white that when those who are standing on the earth look up, it won't be the sun that blinds them because this will be lighter, whiter, and brighter than that. Brothers and sisters, when that day comes, every person whose feet are standing upon this earth will look up no matter where they're at and see that same thing. And some will search for a hole to crawl in. Some will search to hide. But some will look up and rejoice because they know what is coming. Brothers and sisters, if uh, you look up on that day and you don't feel like a sinner, who's completely and totally dependent upon Jesus Christ, we're going to be one of those that are looking for the cracks in the rocks to hide in. Because, brothers and sisters, repentance is the key. It always has been. Repentance is the key to everything. 
It's the key to your relationship with God, and it's the key to your relationship with each other. Brothers and sisters, with that repentance, it doesn't matter how many testimonies you hear, how many experiences you've had, how many visions you've seen, because you'll never be able to get through that door. Because what unlocks that door is the key to is the key is repentance. I I, uh, <laughs> I feel so very blessed to be a member of this church, and yet I'm so concerned <clears throat> when you look around and you see the condition, the people that have fallen by the wayside. Um, I have a lot of prejudices against. Uh, people and groups that I feel I've done harm to the work. And I don't know why I should feel that way. It's not mine. The power to uh, the power to hold this church up, the power to make this work explode is not mine. It's not mine to give. Yet if certain people come to mind or certain groups <clears throat> I just feel that churning in my stomach. <clears throat> and I uh, I don't feel like that that's the right response, but yeah, that's still what I have. I know I have a long way to go before I'm eligible for anything. But I know that uh, I'm in good company. It's just as I have a long way to go, brothers and sisters, uh, I hate to say this, I don't want to tell you your sinners and slap you down, but so do you. We all do. We all have so far to go. And the only hope that we have in this is Jesus Christ. And that's it. There isn't anything else. There's, there's no place else to look. There, there just isn't anything else. There is nothing else that matters. That's it. That's why the gospel is so simple. Because it's Jesus Christ who points the way to the Father. It's repentance. It's faith and it's a baptism. And that's it. It's so simple that you can teach it to an eight-year-old. It just isn't anything complicated. Brothers and sisters, we need to, uh, we need to decrease. We need to decrease so that Jesus Christ can increase.